Hello and welcome to the National Press Club of Australia for today's Westpac Address. I'm Tom Connell, a political reporter with Sky News, also a director here at the club. And as has been noted for today's address, we did arrive one side of the family as O'Connells, all the way from County Kerry. Our guest today is the leader of Sinn Féin and leader of the opposition in the Irish Parliament, Mary Lou Macdonald. Her address comes at a time when her party is in the ascendancy, uh, having won the most seats at the Northern Ireland election and also polling showing Sinn Féin uh, support record levels as well in the Republic. The party's long-stated aim of government has never been more realistic and achievable. For those of you watching at home, you can join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at PressClubOst. Our hashtag is NPC. Please welcome Mary Lou Macdonald. So, Gurumile uh, Mahagut, Tom, thank you so much, and spoken like a true Kerry man. At the outset, I, I have to say uh, and give uh, an explanation for the raggedness of my voice. Uh, I left uh, an oncoming heat wave in Dublin to be rained on in Western Australia, in Perth. So that's, that, that's some kind of uh, phenomenal uh, achievement. Uh, many thanks to the National Press Club of Australia for your very kind invitation to address you all today. I am delighted to be in your beautiful country. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, and I pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. There's a very wise Aboriginal proverb about life, and it, and it goes like this. We are all visitors to this time, this place. We're just passing through. Our purpose here is to observe, to learn, to grow, to love, and then we return home. The journey from Ireland to Australia is a long one. Our countries are half the world away, literally. And yet the bond between our people is not only the bond of friendship, but of family. For generations under different and often tragic circumstances, Irish people have in their droves seen Australia as a haven, making the long journey by boat, by plane, in search of work, security, acceptance, and a better life. The Irish eyes that first took in the sight of Australia's coastline were taken here in the cold chains of bondage. They were followed by the huddled masses who fled the Great Famine on Goethe Moor. They came here destitute, desperate, sustained only by the hope of a better tomorrow. Moor came exiled by British political persecution, those who stood for Ireland's freedom and the rebellions of the United Irishmen, the Young Irelanders, and of course, the Fenians. Many of those patriots found their way to these shores, and from the get-go, the Irish spirit landed in Australia. Going right back to the Eureka Stockade, we find the rebellious quality of the Irish character to the fore in each chapter of the fight for economic justice and social equality in Australia. In more recent times, from the 1980s to the present day, Irish people came to Australia seeking jobs, opportunity and adventure too. The tearful loss of young generations to cycles of economic recession and emigration is heartbreakingly captured by Irish songwriter Paddy Riley in his song, The Flight of the Earls. It goes, it's not murder, fear or famine that makes us leave this time. We're not going to join MacAlpine's Fusiliers. We've got brains and we've got visions. We've got education too. But we just can't throw away these precious years. The history of people leaving Ireland across generations is spoken about in tragic terms of loss. But it has to be said also that the silver lining of emigration is found in the unique contribution the Irish have made to societies throughout the world and indeed the opportunities our people have enjoyed 
across the world and here in Australia. Because you see, to be Irish is to be from a small island, but it is also to be part of a powerful global family. We Irish are known for our lyricism, but it was in fact an Australian, your former Prime Minister Bob Hawke, who captured the spirit of this perfectly in his speech to the Dáil, the Irish Parliament in Dublin in 1987. He said, Ireland is the head of a huge empire in which Australia and the United States are the principal provinces. It's an empire acquired not by force of Irish arms, but by force of Irish character. An empire not of political coercion, but of spiritual affiliation, created by the thousands upon thousands of Irish men and women who chose to leave their shores or who were banished from them and helped in the building of new societies over the years. This was a tribute, I believe, that could only have been paid by a true friend. So 35 years later, let me return the compliment. The people of Ireland are grateful for the friendship of Australia, for the sanctuary, for the fair go, for the boundless opportunities, for the new lives created and families raised in this special land. For whatever can be said of the Irish character and our contribution to Australian society, the same can be said in equal measure of Australian resilience, ingenuity, openness and fair play. It's true to say that for a great many Irish people, Australia has been their light on the hill. The special relationship between Australia and Ireland is an epic saga of human connection. And just as the chapters of a book reveal the evolution of a story, the passage of time shapes the progress of a nation. My friends, Ireland has changed and Ireland is changing. The people of Ireland voted resoundingly for marriage equality in 2015 and repealed the Eighth Amendment in 2018, which overturned the constitutional ban on abortion. These milestones reflect an Ireland emerging from the shadow of religious dogma and strict social sanction. They were signposts to the new republic that this generation is shaping. A generation determined to achieve the Ireland denied to our parents and our grandparents before us. A nation not held back by the past, but one rising to a modern vision of the Ireland that can be. The politics of a new Ireland has come full circle. 100 years ago, Ireland was partitioned under threat of an immediate and terrible war by Britain. The result was catastrophic. A country divided, a sectarian headcount, a gerrymandered border, the establishment of two reactionary claustrophobic states. In the northern six counties, a one-party state excluded nationalists from power, denied them rights and opportunities, and subjected them to sectarian pogrom. While the South became a deeply conservative place which marginalised women, the poor and political progressives. A century on, and to borrow from our poet W.B. Yeats, all is changed, changed utterly. The oppressive northern orange state is gone. The perpetual unionist majority is gone and it's not coming back. <laughs> A new generation is moving on together. A fact underscored by the result of the Northern Assembly election in May in which Sinn Féin emerged as the largest party. This was a vote for equality, for progress and for real partnership. It was the vote of a generation. 
Sinn Féin deputy leader, our friend Michelle O'Neill, a nationalist woman, has been elected as first minister in a state that was designed to ensure that this could never, ever happen. In fact, a decade ago, commentators would have claimed that Sinn Féin had Buckley's chance of ever occupying the office of First Minister. So now impossible is just a word. As the people place their trust in a new direction, as they choose for real change, they voted for a First Minister for all who will lead a government for all. This is a positive step forward mirrored by the historic February 2020 general election result in the South. As people rallied to the flag of progressive change, Sinn Féin won more votes than any other party, won a record number of seats and fundamentally changed the Irish political landscape. While the establishment parties clubbed together to deny the people a government for change, Sinn Féin now, for the very first time, leads an opposition that stands up for them every day. That's our job. And I am so very, very proud to be the first woman, the first female leader of the opposition in Ireland. <laughs> Sinn Féin is leading change right across Ireland and the prospect of Sinn Féin leading government north and south is now a very real one. I want to lead a government in Dublin that will deliver a fresh start for workers and build a fair and equal society for everyone. So at the next general election, we will ask the Irish people to give us that chance. This seismic change is happening as we approach the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, the peace accord that brought an end to decades of conflict and set out the vision for reconciliation between the people of our island. A peace process that defied the odds and demonstrated that even the most seemingly intractable of conflicts can be mediated and can be resolved. Ireland's journey shows that peace can triumph, that we can fix what is broken. It shows what can be achieved when people come together in common purpose. It is an international success story. It has, of course, faced great challenges over the years. In recent years, Brexit has been toxic and divisive. It invited disaster for Ireland economically, politically and socially. Throughout the Brexit negotiations with the European Union, the British government has cynically used Ireland's peace, our political stability and our prosperity as bargaining chips. See, there is no good Brexit for Ireland. However, the Irish protocol negotiated and agreed by Britain and the EU limits the worst impacts of Brexit and protects the Good Friday Agreement, the all-Ireland economy, and prevents a hard border on our island. It is also the means by which the north of Ireland maintains access to the European single market. It is a good thing. It is succeeding. The North has prospered. All Ireland trade has grown. Yet, it has been the agenda of successive Tory Prime Ministers, including the departing Boris Johnson, to turn their back on their agreements, sowing confrontation rather than goodwill. The Tories have persistently undermined the protocol. They have consistently attacked the Good Friday Agreement and threatened to break international law time and again. Mr Johnson allows the Democratic Unionist Party to block the formation of a government in Belfast. He then uses this political deadlock as a threadbare excuse for unilateral action, pursuing his self-serving agenda to cling to power at all costs. Well, we saw how that worked out for him. Boris Johnson's interactions with Ireland have been wholly negative. In December last, I said that British Prime Ministers come and go 
and that the Good Friday Agreement would outlast Mr Johnson and so it has come to pass. Everyone in Ireland, throughout the world, who values the transformative va value of the agreement must now remain vigilant in its defence. Whoever succeeds Boris Johnson in number 10 Downing Street must change direction. The next British Prime Minister must re-engage with the spirit of 1998 and with the good faith that paved the way for the Good Friday Agreement. So now is the time to assert the primacy of politics and democracy, to implement agreements and commit to abide by the conventional democratic norms. That holds true for the Good Friday Agreement, for the Brexit Protocol, for reconciling our past and for the conversation on our constitutional future, which is now underway. We've built the peace and now we look to the next phase, the reunification of Ireland. We are living now in the end days of partition. And the momentum behind Irish unity is unprecedented. We are energised with the opportunity to build a new united Ireland. We have the generation that can, that will redefine our nation. The Good Friday Agreement provides for referendums on Irish unity and I believe that these will happen in this decade. So we must prepare. Both governments have a responsibility to prepare. The Irish government in particular has a duty to change from bystanders to persuaders for Irish unity because the people of Ireland are ready. This is an important time in shaping Ireland's future. It's an exciting time, a positive time, full of potential. Irish unity is about opportunity. The social and economic opportunities are immense. The reunification of Ireland will be a positive and a progressive development for the whole world. I know that nothing truly great has ever been achieved alone. International solidarity with Ireland is as important today as it was 30 years ago. Ireland needs our international friends. We need Australia to join us on our journey. We ask our friends to be energetic and proactive in advocating for Irish unity at every opportunity, to walk with us on this final length of the road to full freedom and nationhood. Unifying Ireland isn't about reclaiming territory. It's about uniting our people. It's about building the Irish nation anew. Ireland can be a united republic one that stands as a bastion of social equality, economic prosperity, justice, diversity and inclusion. These are the values that we share with the people of Australia. Sinn Féin's vision for Ireland is of a country where you are celebrated when you are at your strongest and supported in your weaker moments. A country where, as you Australians would say, everyone gets a fair go. A Sinn Féin government will focus on getting the basics right. We want our people to have homes they can afford to buy or rent, a strong public health service that works for everyone, childcare services that don't break the bank, a fair economy built on good jobs, decent wages and stronger workers' rights. Ireland is now, for many international partners, the gateway to the European market. We are an ancient land, but we are a very young country. We have the youngest population in the European Union. We have a highly skilled, educated and enormously productive workforce and a strong enterprise culture. Ireland is a hub for international talent and we are open for business, for collaboration and for progress. We want a greener, cleaner Ireland, a greener, cleaner world. I believe Ireland, like, like Australia, can play an important role in how the human family responds to the climate crisis. We face a massive, massive challenge to counter decades of environmental damage, 
to chart a new course in how we produce energy in order to secure that brighter, cleaner future. The cost of living crisis, the very real hardship created when workers and families struggle to access affordable, essential energy is evident. And through our abundant wind resource, we can achieve energy independence and develop as an international hub for renewable energy and the production and export of green hydrogen. We can drive the decarbonisation of European economies. I don't have to tell people in Australia that the climate crisis is with us now and that the clock is ticking. But I also believe that there is no limit to what we can achieve for the future of our planet if we work together to get it right. We can achieve a just transition that will turn the tide. Sinn Féin wants to create a prosperity that everyone can have a share in, a prosperity that lifts people up. Friends, as we meet today, war is once again a reality in Europe. A criminal and brutal war on Ukraine is pursued by Vladimir Putin. This war must end. All diplomatic means and channels must be employed to bring this about. Putin must end his bombardment and brutalization of Ukraine. International law must prevail. The Ukrainian people, and they alone, must freely choose their future without fear, threat or coercion. The right to self-determination must prevail. And this must hold true across our world. As a global community, we rely on each other, on our multilateral institutions and the rule of law to keep us all safe. I want, if I can, to take this opportunity to speak directly to the generation of Irish people who are today building a life for yourselves here in Australia. Many of you have made homes here and you will stay. We are very proud of you. Proud of the immense contribution that you make to Australian society. I think, you know, of the story of the legendary Jim Steins, a Gaelic footballer from my home city, the greatest city in the world, of Dublin. <laughs> Jim came to these shores in 1984, and as, as you all know, he became one of the AFL's all-time greats, winning a Brownlow medal in 1991. Indeed, such was the esteem in which he was held that he was afforded a state funeral in Melbourne when he tragically died in 2012. His inspiring legacy reflects the trailblazing influence of so many Irish who make Australia their home. But I also know there's another side to this story, a story of the frustration, the anger of many young Irish people who feel robbed of a life in Ireland. And I know you have been very badly let down, particularly by a housing system characterised by unaffordable homes and extortionate rent, by living costs that were out of control long before we experienced this inflationary crisis of today. I understand that many of you are heartbroken, that your hard work and your potential may have been wasted had you stayed at home. I know that you want to be with your family, your friends, your community. You want to play for your local GAA club. So I want you to know that we are working hard to change things for you. That we will change things for you. We'll make Ireland the home that you deserve. I'm taken with the state of origin concept in Australian Rugby League. <laughs> where players return to represent their state for which they played most of their junior games. And I just think that this is a really great thing, a great idea for nation building as well as for sport. So to those young Irish people who want to come home, I say, I want you to have the chance to return to your place of origin. I also want you to enjoy your time and your experience in this incredible country for however long it may last. So work hard, enjoy the sun, enjoy the lifestyle, but come home and be part 
of the new Ireland that we must build. We need you. There are no full stops in the work of nation building. Nation building isn't confined to the boundaries of yesterday. I believe that in my heart. This is especially true when it comes to the uplifting of culture, tradition and language. The great Irish rebel, Padraig Pearce, wrote in Irish, Tír gan Shanga, Tír gan Anam, Anam, which means a country without its language is a country without a soul. I think these words powerfully express how precious is respect for the rights of native people, how important it is to heal the wounds of the past, to recognise that it is only on justice and equality that we can build nations of real unity, to name and defeat racism and bigotry and exclusion, to own up to our failures of the past, to face down poverty and to embrace our people left on the margins, to say with sincerity that our communities are not behind nor in front of each other, but beside each other on the road to a better place. I know this sentiment rings true for the people of Australia too, as with open hearts you work for a better future for First Nations Australians, for all Australians. It will take great courage and hope as you continue the journey of reconciliation, weaving together the rainbow of your great country. And we too reach for that same spirit in Ireland as we seek to unite and heal divisions that have held us back. I am very humbled again to speak on the land of the Nungawal people. It for me is a privilege. The mission of building nations and raising up our people is indeed a continuous one. It's a task that we Irish and Australians share with an equal passion. We hold on tight to our hopes for our people. We remember our past and we reach bravely for tomorrow. There's an old Irish proverb, Erska Akela Awaran Nadini. It's in the shelter of each other that the people live. And I think it is undeniable that the people of Ireland and Australia have lived in the shelter of each other for generations. Our great friendship, our enduring connection has been that light on the hill. Long may that light burn strong and bright as a beacon to the world and a clarion call to our future. Thanks very much. Uh, Mary Lou, I'm really interested in the referendum timing you mentioned. So this decade, uh, our own experience with referenda in Australia and probably the closest one, not the same importance, but the Republic was that once you had one and it wasn't successful, anyone pushing for one gets told we've had a vote. You don't get another one just yet. Are you really conscious of making sure there's strong support and it's successful the first time or just getting some sort of vote as soon as possible? Well, no, Tom. I mean, obviously, the objective is to successfully carry a referendum. Um, and, you know, the Good Friday Agreement provides for referendums, so it's not that Ireland is asking for or petitioning for the right to have uh, referendums. That's now established as a matter of law. It should also be remembered that the, 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 the winning margin is 50% plus one, the standard democratic norm. But of course we would have an ambition to win the referendum by a much more substantial margin uh, than that. And crucially, uh, we believe that even for those who would campaign against reunification, for our unionist brothers and sisters, and they will naturally uh, campaign for the maintenance of the union, but nonetheless, it's very, very important that everybody, including unionism, understands that they have a voice, a stake and a say in the journey to union, to a united Ireland and in shaping the final destination. That's really, really important. So in terms of the timing of things, 
The most important thing that I can say is that we need to begin preparation now. There has to be a conversation right across uh, the island, but also with our international uh, Irish community about the way forward, about what a new Ireland uh, looks like. And I've, I've pressed this case with Michal Martin, our serving Taoiseach, with Leo Varadkar, his predecessor and uh, his successor uh, in, in, uh, in all likelihood. Uh, we've pressed that very, very uh, strongly. We haven't had a positive reception to it, but I, I have said, and I repeat, I think there is now an urgency in that preparation. So it's not simply having referendums for the sake of it. I mean, this is a moment of history and a moment of unparalleled opportunity for, for all of us. So it's our ambition to win it and to win it well. I can't give you a date or a precise time. I can't tell you when the polling booths will open. Um, but I can certainly say to you that all of the signs, even for those who had their heads buried, buried deepest in the sand, all of the evidence of political change is now manifest right across Ireland. And you know, politics, political leaders have an obligation to read the tea leaves, read the signs, understand what's happening um, in, in our society and to lead from the front. And that's, that's really what I, I am asking the, the Irish government in particular to do. This seems to be, in Ireland still, from your opponents, the biggest determination is to keep Sinn Féin away from being in government in some form. Is that just... Uh, do, you, do you feel part of that, I suppose, is historical enmity that hasn't gone away yet? And how does that go away? Well, I'm not sure. I was beginning to kind of take it personally, but then I gave... I, I had a little chat with myself and gave myself a shake. Um, so, I, I mean, politics is competitive. Um, and I, I think world experience and history demonstrates that those who ha hold power rarely, in fact never, surrender it and say, you were right, we were wrong, here you go, let's move on. That's, it's not how, that's not how the dynamic of, of political change operates in any society. And for a century, um, two political parties have essentially had it all their own way. And, in some respects, we're Ireland's oldest political party, but we're kind of new kids on the block um, as well. The unfortunate thing is that for those who would have that sense of enmity, Tom, and wish just to keep us out at any cost, they misunderstand that actually the big growth in Sinn Féin is part of the story, a very important part of this story, because we are at the vanguard of pushing change. But it's not the totality of the story. The appetite in Ireland for change is much bigger than Sinn Féin. And whoever is in government, at whatever stage, the need to prepare and deliver Irish reunification is a national and indeed an international endeavour. It's not down to any one political party. But you're right to note that they were kind of keen to keep us out. Um, I'm being polite because I know Australians are very polite. So. Most of I'm the time. I'm just rowing in, you know. What about Australia's role? You mentioned you hope Australia joins the push in some way. Would that involve our Prime Minister talking to the British Prime Minister in some way, even if it's behind closed doors and saying, we think you should at least not oppose this? Is that what you're hoping, that it reaches that level? I, I believe that um, people who value democracy and freedom everywhere should be proponents of Irish reunification. I mean, we came through, and I'm not, don't worry, Tom, I'm not going to rehearse every twist and turn of it, but look, we came through a, an experience of colonisation, of destitution, emigration, conflict, partition, all of those things. And now we have an opportunity in a democratically mandated fashion to, to fix that. And to me, that's the sensible, democratic, um, modernising, pioneering uh, thing to do. Uh, so yes, it, it, it means that we, we will certainly be talking to everybody. I mean, we, we believe that our, our European partners, who, by the way, in, in the wake of Brexit, made a very important statement and a very important commitment, and it was this, that Brexit notwithstanding, 
in the event when Ireland is reunified, the whole island automatically comes back under the European Union umbrella. Back. That's an important thing and was an important message for people who deeply resented having voted against Brexit and being coerced out of the European Union um, anyhow. So I, I believe that European leaders, just as Australian leaders, should advocate for the final leg, the final logical leg of the peace journey in Ireland, and that is reunification. And of course, I wouldn't, I wouldn't presume to say to your, your new Prime Minister what he should do or, or how he should articulate that. But, but I would hope, in a bipartisan way, actually, across the aisle, as the Americans say, that there would be an understanding and a support, a tacit support for the Irish cause. And I get the sense that for you, Boris Johnson and Brexit hasn't exactly hurt the chances of reunification. Well, no, it, it, it hasn't. I mean, on the, on the contrary, I think for lots of people who, you know, may not have been very politically conscious, may never have really reflected on um, the border, partition, the constitution of the future. I think Brexit came as a big wake-up call, absolutely, because it demonstrated that actually, irrespective of the democratic view of the Irish people, you know, the king of the castle resides uh, in number 10 Downing Street. And by the way, when the COVID um, epidemic then hit, uh, we, we, faced that, we faced that reality again because we were left with two, at times, very different standards and, and approaches to managing um, a, a public health emergency. And, you know, whatever your politics are, viruses don't have a political affiliation. You know, human biology is human biology, irrespective of, of where you are in the political spectrum. So I think moments like that, but Brexit in particular, um, raised the, the, the question in a very dramatic way. And I think internationally put a focus again on the fact that our country is partitioned. And let me finish maybe with this, just this observation. I think at a European level, and people will have seen all of the toing and froing on, on the protocol and, and, and all of that big politics play out. But the reality is that Brexit has, has resulted in a situation where the border in Ireland, on Ireland is no longer simply our problem. It's now a European problem. And, and it's not going to go away. That's, that's for keep. So I think that changes the diplomacy and the politics um, uh, around all of that. But Brexit was bad. I mean, don't, please don't misunderstand. We, we campaigned against it. Um, and it, 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 has, it, it still holds the potential to be very, very damaging for, for Ireland. <coughs> You've made a bit of a pitch to expats as well. I noticed in one newspaper it was specifically for um, Irish expat tradies, which might send a bit of a shiver down the spine for anyone trying to get a builder in Australia at the moment. <laughs> Are you sure you should be making that pitch right now? Well, look, so let me be clear. I'm not here to, like, some kind of <laughs> snake charmer, you know, to lure tradies back to, to, to Ireland. Th there is a shortage of these incredibly talented, skilled workers uh, internationally. I know you're feeling mm. it in Australia, I can tell you we're feeling it um, at home. Look, people will choose to, to live, to work and to settle where it works for them and for, for their life ambition and that's, that's great. And people will continue to come to Australia to build their lives here and to, and to take trips home to see their mammy or their granny or whatever the case may be. But I'm speaking more directly to a set of people that I know have the feeling that they were forced to leave, that it was not voluntary. And for me, I, I think for political leadership in Ireland, we have to ensure that people have the choice. So, and if you want to come home, that it's possible for you to come home, that you will have the opportunity uh, to live and to prosper and to flourish at home. Yeah, but don't forget the sunshine in Australia, of course. Well, uh, hold on a minute. <laughs> Sorry, there's sun in Dublin and I told you I came to Perth and I got rained on. So don't mind him, tradies. Sun is shining. All right, I'd better go to some questions. First one comes from Andrew Tillett. Uh, Andrew Tillett from the Financial Review and uh, Vice President here at the club. Um, I guess one thing Ireland has got going for at the moment, it does have a pretty good uh, rugby union team. <laughs> beating, beating the All Blacks, which is something more than the Australian Wallabies can say at the moment. Um, 
And going back to the issue of reunification, and we saw during the Scottish referendum that the, the argument used to the, by the no camp there was that um, uh, it was better off being in... Scotland was better off being in Britain um, uh, rather than going it alone. Do you think... Uh, and I appreciate the argument about, you know, reunification being the last step in the peace process and things like that, but playing devil's advocate here, do you think that that's a very sort of a potent sort of argument for people in Northern Ireland that being part of um, the UK, you're part of a bigger sort of uh, country, one that, you know, obviously is a permanent member of the United Nations, uh, you know, a much bigger economy and things like that. Um, it, it, how do you sort of overcome that, those sorts of um, appeals there that, you know, what, what you lose by joining... You, you might lose more by joining Ireland than, 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 than what you gain sort of thing. Well, th thanks very much for the, for the question and for your homage to our, to our rugby players. <laughs> um, so, no, I, I don't accept that argument. As a matter of fact, it's in reverse. Um, you see... Uh, the northern state um, has been left in a, in a permanently weak position because of partition. That, that's the truth. And if you look at the economic indicators that kind of figure out how, how the country is doing, the border region in particular, north and south, is particularly hard hit. And we all, we all know this. We know also and Irish business in particular, and the unions, business in particular, have known for a very long time that to actually build prosperity, you have to do it on an all-island basis. They've been ahead of this curve for quite um, some time. Brexit has meant, to put it bluntly, that Britain has forfeited access to a market of 500 million people. Now, the British market is not, it's a fraction of that. So the idea that you would be losing in terms of market access and opportunities to collaborate simply doesn't uh, stack up. I know, uh, I know we have some university folk here um, and they uh, may well know uh, that certainly for, the, for third level and for institutions of learning, there, there was huge worry. I mean, there was a massive kickback all across Britain and in the north of Ireland against Brexit because that kind of splendid, I said, that doesn't work. It, it, it never worked, but it certainly doesn't work uh, in our age. But also say this to you. You see, and, and Brexit illustrates it, for, for citizens living in the North, you can be put in a situation where you can have a democratic view, you can cast a democratic vote, and you can be overruled by a Tory in number 10 Downing Street. By the way, um, there are no Conservatives in the north of Ireland in the party political sense. The Tories don't get elected. I, th I think they've got a couple of hundred votes. Sorry, that, that was wrong of me to understate their strength. So that, that, that's, just, that's just wrong. I mean, it, it, the basis of all human advancement and driving prosperity has to be the self-determination of people and to, to make decisions close to the ground that work. But, but certainly it has to mean that your democratic view can't be just cast, uh, cast aside. So the economic opportunities in terms of reunification are enormous. And in fact, many of our institutions now back home are looking at the scenario and starting to measure in ways that they hadn't before the dynamics of the northern um, economy. The, by the way, after Brexit, all island uh, trade has p spiked. Supply chains have changed, the situation has changed. Everybody was delighted uh, with this because it's good news. But at the Tory uh, party conference, they had a wake kind of, at, you know, and a tear was shed. It was evidence of something destructive and negative. So the points that you have made in your, in your very legitimate question are exactly the speaking points that unionism will rehearse in a referendum campaign. But they're simply wrong. They are simply wrong on every level. Partition has held Ireland back by every measure, every conceivable measure. And is that the mood, in, particularly among the younger people in, in Northern Ireland, that they can see that being part of the UK and Great Britain is not what it might have been 10, 15 years ago? 
But you see, for, for lots of, of, of the younger population, 10 or 15 years ago feels like almost prehistoric to some of the, you know, the kids uh, yeah. coming up. So um, I, I, I think certainly I, I instance two moments in recent political Irish political history, uh, marriage equality and repeal of the, the eighth. Those were two big moments for young people uh, on the island of Ireland, not just in the Republic, but right across the um, island. Uh, Brexit can be added to that. I, I know a lot. I, um, from time to time, speak at universities, you know, in Queen's and, uh, and uh, the University of Ulster and beyond in the north. And I, I have never been uh, in, the, in any of the universities but that somebody at the end, lots of young people have come forward and said, look, we don't vote for you. We won't vote for you, but this Brexit thing is crazy. Because my assessment of young people globally, but certainly at home in Ireland, is that they want a chance to travel, to work, to learn, to come home when they're ready, to thrive, to prosper. The idea in a globalised world that you cut yourself off and, and deny to your young people the opportunity to live, work, study, right across a vast territory in the European Union is crazy. And I think, I think young people understand that very acutely. Thank you. Thank you. Next question comes from Nicole Hegarty. Dear Gritch. Dear Gritch. Uh, Nicole Hegarty from ABC News. Um, I have multiple questions, but I'll stick with one. Okay. Um, so uh, Australia currently accounts for less than 1% of Ireland's exports. Given the Northern Protocol tensions and what um, disruption that's caused already, uh, and the prospect of potential tariffs on Irish foods uh, entering the UK, some discussion around that at the moment, how critical is it for Ireland to see Australia's discussions with EU, with the Australia-EU free trade deal, to really pick up speed swiftly? And where do you envisage exports growing in terms of Australia dairy or tech? Okay, so uh, the, the first cause of concern around the protocol, because Boris Johnson, as you know, the Tory government is proposing to junk, to hollow out the protocol. So the immediate concern is to keep that intact. Um, but I take your point beyond that to consider what, what things look like. Look, a trade uh, agreement with, between the EU and Australia makes sense. Uh, it makes sense in, in a world that is increasingly small um, in terms of innovation and tech um, that, that we work together and that that, that, that uh, proceeds without uh, undue delay. Here's the only caveat that I have, but it's a significant one. You see, in all of these deals that we strike now as a global community, we have to have our eye on the climate ball as well. That, that's, that's the truth. We have to have our eye also on social standards, workers' protections, and so on. So those are the caveats that need to get built into any trading arrangement between Australia and the EU, or the EU and any other um, territory. With a name like Hegarty, maybe one more question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, my great-grandparents came over from Ireland many a year ago. Okay. From Donegal and Cork. Oh, from Donegal. And oh, Cork beautiful. as well. And as Cork. far away as you could yeah, possibly no, get. Yeah, extreme but. north and south, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, my other question is, uh, as you've said publicly, Sinn Féin wants to see a referendum on reunification of Ireland within the decade. Well, Sinn Féin has recorded historic support in just the past week in Northern Ireland we've seen huge bonfires the tricolour uh, draped across them call flutes of Sinn Féin MPs in Northern Ireland burnt um, given that a referendum on this would undoubtedly see a rise in tension among sectors within Northern Ireland in particular at what cost will you pursue this and how will you ensure that it doesn't reignite violence for potentially another decade? Okay, so let me be absolutely definitive on this. The process of reunification will be orderly, it will be peaceful and it will be democratic. And I will not give an inch on that. And I, I really believe that there is a strong onus on every political representative and leader to state that categorically. I will not even countenance the scenario that you have 
painted up. That cannot happen under any set of circumstances. And I say that as, by the way, as one of the effigies that was hanged and burnt on a, on a bonfire, uh, along with uh, so my, some of my colleagues and indeed the leader of the Alliance Party, also a woman, uh, and the acting Minister for, for Justice. You see, people decided for peace. And the truth is, and I'm very conscious, you know, in, on, on an international stage, um, a big bonfire, a bus lit on the Falls Road, and no, nobody should be lighting up buses, by the way. I'm not trying to in any way explain that uh, away. These are very limited phenomena. The war is over. We are moving to the future. And there is no appetite across wide society to return to armed actions and, and, and conflict. And I cannot accept, I don't think any Democrat could accept, that some unspoken possibility of perhaps tensions somewhere would throw us off our democratic course. I mean, we can't operate like that. And, and let me also say this, I fully respect that unionist people, families, I mean, I, I have one group of uh, women from the north visit me every year. It's a mixed group. We've uh, loyalists, you know, from the Shankill, and I tell you, they're certainly not voting for us. But they come and they visit, and we've, you know, I absolutely respect the integrity of their position and the fact that they will campaign and vote for the status quo. I get that. I respect that. Equally, there has to be respect for the fact that others will take a different view and we will campaign and, and vote for, for uh, Irish reunification. But we can't start adding a, a calculus of threat into all of that. And I'm stating very clearly, as the leader of Sinn Féin, Mar Uchtaran Sinn Féin, uh, Mar Ciannara Public Tánach, that as a Republican leader, that any notion that we descend back into any form of threat, coercion or violence is not on. And we need to hear that from unionism. We need to hear that loudly. We need to hear that clear. And we simply will not countenance the scenario that you have set. By the way, people in huge numbers are much more advanced in their thinking than some might suspect. And uh, in the course of the last election that Tom and I uh, spoke about in the North, I did a walk about around uh, Belfast city centre and you can well imagine uh, it's not so long ago that the leader of Sinn Féin did not walk around Belfast city centre but it went very very well um, and people uh, and this has happened since the election to all of my colleagues people who self-describe as unionist people are coming and saying so what about my pension what about health care what's it gonna look like how are we gonna talk about it it's not that they want it's not their first option it is not their first option. But, but, but increasingly, we need to demonstrate our bona fides that we are moving this along and that there is a place for, for everyone. And for, for the vast, vast majority of people, that's, that's a good thing. Fringe elements cannot, cannot hijack political pro progress. <laughs> Next question comes from Tim Shaw. Oh, thanks, Tom. Uh, Mary Lou McDonald, thank you so much for your address today. Tim Shaw, director of the National Press Club. Only hours ago, 157 House Republicans voted against the continuation of same-sex marriage in the United States. Uh, 47 Republicans voted with all the Democrats. I'd like your comment, if you can, about um, the overturning of Roe v Wade, the comment I've just made relating to same-sex marriage. And my second part of the question is going to be about the youth of Ireland and how that reflects the future. But to Roe v Wade and uh, same-sex marriage in the United States. Well, you know, um, I think these events and the politics really of the last number of years has given us all a really salutary wake-up call. I say this as a woman who, you know, you'd imagine that there are certain rights issues that have just been decided and they are settled matters and that society has moved on until you wake up one morning and you discover that in fact those rights are being unpicked uh, and that you have to go out and stand your ground and, and make the case and fight your corner um, again. Uh, so 
my first comment is not actually to the high politics of this, but to actually the human, the lived reality of it. Uh, and I would say that as people and as citizens, we all need to wake up. We need to be active and we need to protect the progress that we have made, whether it is in Europe, the United States or Australia. But I find it, I find it um, very dispiriting that there is this instinct to, to draw us back with the same old arguments. And I respect that people have moral positions on all of these questions. Mm. I, I absolutely respect that. But I also know this, the law has to protect people without fear, without failure. And it cannot be interpreted through the prism of any theological or religious view or dogma. Um, and in, in Ireland, we have seen um, the consequences at times where religion became implicated in, in what was a very, very, very difficult uh, and challenging political environment. It's not, it's never, that's never a good, good place to go. At our recent federal election, 21.5% of those people going to the ballot box were millennials. 21% that went to the ballot box are baby boomers. Are you seeing the same trend in the in the Republic and do you see uh, that the future of the kind of programs that you're talking about, respect for, but moving away from religious dogma, you know, respect for the past, how do the younger Irish influence those older Irish that are still feeling the pain, the anguish from the violence, the death and the interposing of the United Kingdom upon Irish politics? How do the youth of Ireland deliver for you the votes that you want? Well, I think the, the youth of Ireland bring an awful lot of plain common sense uh, to the table when it comes to a lot of these debates. And can I say I include in that my own children, um, who generationally think that a lot of the things that seize us, that we become very tense about, aren't things to be bothered particularly about. Um, but see other things as, as huge priorities. So I think it's very important that one generation respects, but also challenges uh, another. And I know in my experience, certainly of the marriage equality referendum uh, in Ireland, it was absolutely the case that younger people influenced not just their parents, but their grandparents too. How do I know this? Because they told me mm. on the door. I also know though, that in, in the case of the repeal of the eighth referendum, people of my age, and I'm not sure do I fall into a youth category in your eyes. <laughs> But I, I'm going to fess up and say From where that I'm, I'm not. standing. Yes. Thank you. I'm very touched. Yeah. Um, or you're very touched, but <laughs> one of us is very touched. Uh, so in in that case, women of my generation, in particular, who had grown up with this awful oppressive sense, you're a girl, you're a woman, all of that, we influenced our daughters. I've, I've no doubt about that. I also think we influenced our mothers and I certainly influenced mine. So these things ebb and flow and generations have now been born on the island of Ireland who have never known conflict. They've never known a British army checkpoint or soldiers on the street or any of that. Isn't that amazing? For them, the Good Friday Agreement is history mm. or the old days, the old times as some of the young people so what do you mean by the old times? Oh, 1990, okay, yeah. So that, isn't that great? And there has to be a societal impulse to actually go with that, you know, and to embrace that, because that's how change is made. That's how progress is made. The signatories of the, the 1916 proclamation, the hunger strikers in 1981, so many incredibly powerful political activists, you know, were young people. They achieve big things and they were only kids. You look at them now and you say, I could go back to even the, the war, uh, the Tan War, the War of Independence a century ago, the Civil War, which was horrific. Mm. They, they were young. They were young people who took a chance and who said, we will make our mark on this land. I think that's a brilliant thing. And I, I hope that's happening in Australia too. I, I feel certain that it is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next question from Nick Stewart. I'm a Stuart, my wife's a McGrath, but this census, I think for the first time in five or six generations, we actually said, we're actually Australian. 
We live here. We don't live in Ireland or anywhere else. Um, we, we're not politicians like Bob Hawke or Kennedy who needed to, to reinforce those roots in order to gain votes. The world has changed. I think your policy, the party policy of Sinn Féin, is that you move out of NATO. You were highly critical of what Russia has done in the Ukraine. What's your feeling now? Is it time for you to change, to actually begin to recognise the world, and you have recognised the world the way it is in the past, but do we all need to recognise that the world is changing and that we need new policies in order to adopt to that? I think that's a fair comment. We, we absolutely need to recognise that the world has changed and changing, and we need to guard against history repeating itself. That's, that's really important. Ireland's not in NATO. Uh, we are a military neutral. We are non-aligned. And that is a position that I firmly, passionately believe that we need to keep to. And let me explain to you why. It's not about being ambivalent or indifferent to what happens in the world, far from it. But I happen to believe in world and international affairs there is a valuable, indeed a vital role for neutral, credible interlocutors in a world that is, as you say, changed and changing and increasingly dangerous. We're a small little island, you know. We're not, we've no ambition to be some kind of military hyper superpower. We're, we're also in some respects, almost an outlier as a European nation within the European Union is that in that we were the colonised, not the coloniser. A felt bit like that. Ukraine? Well, like Ukraine, yes, but you've asked me about Irish neutrality and I'm trying to elucidate the, the point for you. And we have to be true to that experience, not to keep looking at the past, but because that's how we bring the best of what we can be and do. And I, I will tell you this much. Our Irish uh, peacekeepers, when they donned the Blue Beret of the United Nations, do an incredible job. They can go anywhere with no colonial baggage, none at all. And not aligned, affiliated, uh, or, or anything else to any of the big power blocks. And listen, I respect that everybody's geopolitics is different. I, I'm not proposing to intrude on, on your affairs whatsoever. But I will say this, that we know where our place is in the world. If I had a criticism of us as a country, I would say we have not been nearly expansive or energetic enough in leveraging that neutral status. And I've made the point to our European colleagues, to uh, diplomats and so on, that actually I think the military neutrals need to be recognised in European basic law in the EU treaties, not regarded as a problem, but to be regarded as another platform, another lever to diffuse disputes and conflicts, to ensure that you're guided by international law first and foremost, first and last, and multilateralism. The great wars, the big wars in the world happened when the international community, that infrastructure fell down and failed. So we need to be very careful that we mind what we have and ensure that it works because ultimately that's, that's what keeps the Middle East, gives us a prospect to move that on, Europe, Asia, beyond. That, that's, our common, that's our common infrastructure and that's what we're committed to. Thank you. Tony Melville. Uh, Tony Melville, Director of the National Press Club. A great address today, very much enjoyed it. Um, you mentioned the UK Prime Minister. Do you have any... Um, can you expand upon what you were talking about, what you want to see out of the next UK Prime Minister? Um, I won't ask you to endorse a particular candidate. It probably wouldn't be very helpful. Uh, but what, just expand upon that, what you want from a UK um, Prime Minister. Uh, whoever succeeds um, Boris Johnson, and that's a matter for themselves, um, I, I want them to step back from the abyss, step back from the edge. I want them to cease and desist with any suggestion of going alone, acting unilaterally, breaking international law, putting agreements through the shredder. I want them to stop undermining the Good Friday Agreement because make no mistake, that's happening in plain sight and view. I've mentioned the protocol. I could mention another very sensitive um, strand 
which is the manner in which we deal with the past. We've come through conflict. People suffered, as, as you well know, in Ireland and beyond. And how we deal with legacy, with victims, with survivors is incredibly important. And believe it or not, we managed, and this is unusual for Irish people, we managed to agree as political parties how we go about that in an agreement called the Stormont House Agreement. The, the name isn't so much important for this exchange as the fact that we got agreement. And then the British government came in with a heavy hand and said, no, there are national security issues here. That's not happening. So instead, they have now put together legislation that is explicitly and brazenly seeking a, a, an amnesty for their own soldiers, for their proxies and agents who fought a war in Ireland. And they're doing that in that part as now. It's certainly not Article 2 compliant. It does not comply with international law, but they're moving it. I want them to stop doing that. I also want them to become good neighbours. Because we want to be, we're next door neighbours, you know? And by the way, just as there is lots of Irish people here in Australia, there's lots and lots of Irish people in England. I mean, Liverpool, there's a debate as to whether it is in fact English, you know? <laughs> yeah. I'm getting the thumbs up from a Liverpudlian, so you know what I'm saying. So we have to find ways that, that we're good neighbours, but that means ultimately the British system, the British Prime Minister respecting our right to self-determination. Let us be free, build our country. And, and in doing that, actually, we'll build, I believe, the relationship with Britain as well. We'll do it in tandem. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Next question is coming from Mario Sullivan. Well, Margaret, I walked around. It's only a kind to her. Margaret. Marisha Sullivan has called in Australia her son, Antus Neheron. Mario Sullivan, Australian friends for a united Ireland. Conestagayari, a hacked Nagalia. I do wish that not here. Will she a star? No, will she a dull conkeen? I thought she a dull conkeen, or I thought to act well, go arguing an ish. It's better to let the male of us mean that. So um, I've been asked about the, act, the Irish Language Act in, in the north of Ireland just to explain to her. Is that, and will she show all right? Good bra. Mos Fager, yeah. And Fragger 3 Berlin, will she show all right? Yeah, bather. So, um, so, we've been there, so there was a whole thing about the Irish um, <coughs> language. And it, it became really quite farcical in, in, my, in my view. The proposition was and is that Goyal Gori, people who speak Irish, are educated through Irish, live their lives in, in Irish, could access public services in Irish, um, would have their language recognised as a an official language, would have translation facilities, for example, in Parliament. I mean, very modest, just common sense things. And there was a whole reaction and a, and a, a political exploitation of this issue. Um, and it went on and on. By the way, there had been agreement between the governments that we would get an Irish Language Act to protect the language and promote it and so on. Now, I would have preferred, Mari, to be honest with you, if Oct Gaelga had come through the assembly and government in the north. But it became very, very clear to me that unionism were simply not prepared to recognise on Gaelga. Mm -hmm. So I went to the then um, Northern Secretary uh, with my colleagues and said, they won't do it, so you, you will. You will have to. Um, and the, the legislation came through Westminster. Now, we're, we're in a kind of hiatus now because we've no executive and, 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 and we're in that, that level of uh, difficulty. But we, we got the British government finally to move. It wasn't the way we would have wanted it to happen, but it is, ha has happened. And, and you know this, Margaile Gore, um, it's not that the Irish language belongs to anybody. Languages don't belong to people, you know? It's crazy to think that. In fact, very interestingly, in Belfast, in East Belfast, which is a very loyalist, as you know, very staunch unionist neighbourhood, an incredible woman called Linda Irvine, herself a staunch unionist, um, has established uh, a Gael school, an Irish school there. 
and all of those kids whose parents I'm sure have all sorts of politics that's probably not the same as mine, all of those want to learn, enjoy, to love the language and they send their kids to be educated throughout and that's the way it needs to be. Yeah. Yeah. On, that, on that note, can we please continue the applause for Mary Lou McDonald. Thank you for your time today.